Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Malkin Fund, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and twice before when the erudite president of the Russell Sage Foundation for the last 20 years, Dr. Eric Wanner, has been my guest, we've talked about one aspect or another of inequality in America. Well, last time I recalled the pleasure and pride with which in the early 1950s I had so definitively written in the first edition of my documentary history of the United States that the Roosevelt Revolution, FDR's New Deal, had permanently reversed the economic and social inequality that earlier had plagued laissez-faire, dog-eat-dog, social Darwinian post-Civil War industrial America, and had finally in the Great Depression left one-third of our nation ill-fed, ill-clothed, ill-housed. But I had been so incredibly wrong, hadn't foreseen that in our very own times we would experience a veritable counter-revolution in which various New Deal social visions and even programs would seem to have become an endangered species and inequality in our nation seem once again to reflect an ever-widening gap between rich and poor Americans with all of its devastating consequences. Well, without putting words in his mouth, I think it's fair to note that Dr. Wanna didn't demur. Instead, he analyzed the areas where and the reasons why this seems particularly to be the case, ranging from globalization to the incredible decline both of unionization and of political participation. Which leads me to ask Dr. Wanna today, just what light the 2006 midterm elections may shed on the possibility of change for better or for worse. There's a, the dean of American economist, Paul Samuelson, said that predictions are difficult, especially about the future. And I think uh, one day after the election, uh, it would be very hard to hazard a coherent guess about what, uh, what we're going to do at the federal level about inequality. But maybe it would make sense to kind of review uh, a little bit politically how we got to where we are to think about where we might be going. Over the last 30 years, um, political scientists have shown quite conclusively that at the federal level, there's been an increase in polarization between the two parties. If you put individual legislators, members of the House of Representatives, on a liberal to conservative scale, and you measure the overlap between the two parties, what you see is that the overlap has shrunk. Uh, just as inequality has been increasing, polarization at the federal level uh, has been increasing along with it. And some people have argued this makes it more difficult to uh, legislate, uh, sustain the kind of programs that you're talking about uh, to counteract market-driven inequality. Uh, so for example, if polarization gives you gridlock, uh, then if you're trying to do something like update the minimum wage, uh, which as you know has to be increased by vote of the Congress, it doesn't automatically rise uh, with inflation. Uh, it may be more difficult to get a constituency in the middle uh, in order to be able to do that. So one argument has been inequality causes polarization, polarization causes gridlock, which makes it more difficult to counteract inequality. Now, uh, we have great hopes, I suppose, that uh, these, uh, these elections have uh, increased uh, sentiment, political uh, will, uh, to try to counteract inequality, but I don't think we know until we see 
what really has happened. It's one thing to sort people by Democratic, Republican, Democrat versus Republican. It's another thing to figure out where they stand on redistribution. What do you mean, wait till we see what has happened? And again, I don't mean exactly what the numbers are. Are you suggesting that uh, uh, you may not have that movement toward the center? Right. Uh, another thing to say about this polarization is that it's been an asymmetric polarization. That is, the Republican Party demonstrably moved further to the right than the Democrat Party, Democratic Party moved to Please. the left. I, I made a slip. Um, so what you had was a two things, a polarization between the two parties and a general drift right. Now the question will be, has this election stemmed the general drift right and increased representation in the center? I have to admit, a lot of, a lot of moderate Republicans did go down in this election to be replaced by Democrats, and it remains to be seen exactly where they stand on the liberal conservative dimension. What's your, what's your sense of what could be done if indeed the polarization has been diminished to some extent. Okay. I think what we're going to get right away uh, is an increase in the minimum wage. Uh, the Democrats have said they want to do that in the first hundred hours, and, and I would applaud that. But I don't think we should stop there. Uh, just to review, the, the minimum wage is now 5.15 an hour, the federal minimum. Many state wages, minimum wages are already well above the federal minimum. Uh, so in those states, there won't be much effect of an increase in the mid federal may, minimum. But may, I, yeah. may I interrupt a moment? In the states where you say uh, the minimum wage is considerably above the federal wage, have there been any um, indications of trouble, of uh, unintended consequences? It's a very good question, and it's a matter of still white-hot dispute in economics about whether or not raising the minimum wage increases unemployment, particularly unemployment amongst the youth and other low education workers whose, uh, whose productivity may not, according to theory, justify a higher wage. Uh, we have supported a number of studies which look at some of these local increases in minimum wages. Uh, the increase in uh, minimum wage in San Francisco. We're looking at one right now along the Indiana-Illinois border where Illinois raised its minimum wage and Indiana didn't. And generally, we find small, negligible disemployment effects, or none at all. But that is the argument, disemployment. That's right. That's the unintended consequence. And that's a, a straightforward product of uh, one interpretation of economic theory says that you would get that. As you raise the minimum wage, certain workers who may not be employable at that higher wage will not get jobs. They'll lose Has their jobs. Has that historically been the case? I know the fear or the claim has been the case, but have the facts. It's, it's interesting. On my desk is about a 150-page review of all, the, of all the evidence one way or another. And I think the most that one can claim is that there has been a, there is a small effect of large increases in the minimum wage. So uh, at one end of the continuum of this argument, uh, you might, uh, there's evidence that, say, a 10 percent increase in the minimum wage might lead to as much as three quarters of a percentage point of increase in uh, unemployment amongst youth workers, young workers. All right. Where would you go as you move on from changing the minimum wage? Okay. Uh, be because I think it's important not to stop with, with just the minimum wage. Um, for example, one thing we ought to do is increase the earned income tax credit. I Explain think, that. Yes, everybody. Uh, should know what the earned income tax credit is. And few people do. And few people do. The, the earned income tax, tax credit is a refundable tax credit to working poor families on earning under a certain threshold income. So at the end of the tax year, if you've earned less than a certain amount, there's a sliding scale, uh, you can file your tax return and actually get uh, a refund on taxes you didn't pay, basically. Okay? So it's a supplement to wages for working families. And it's about a $30 billion program. Uh, it was last increased in the early 90s under Clinton. It's probably the, the best thing that Clinton did by way of materially improving the lot of the working poor. Uh, and it hasn't been increased since then, and it deserves an increase. What is the nature of the increase? If more dollars are appropriated, how are they used? By expanding uh, the coverage? Yes. You would expand the coverage. You would increase the supplement and you would expand the coverage. So you'd have to redesign the schedule and move it further up the income scale. Uh, 
What is it now? What has it been? Uh, it, it clicks in, it goes up to the federal poverty line, basically. So it's, it, it's limited at the federal poverty line. And you can move it above that, because our, our poverty line is, is quite uh, severe. That is, a family living at the poverty line is, is the material well-being of that family is, is very limited. Uh, and much lower, for example, than the poverty lines in Europe. Aha. Uh -huh. Poverty line reflecting then not a determination uh, of what should be, but a line to uh, explain that, because I don't understand it, which is not so strange. A poverty line was... Uh, the U.S. poverty line was developed in the early 60s, uh, and it was basically a multiple of your food budget. So uh, an economist named Mar Molly Orshansky, who was in the uh, agriculture department, uh, developed a way simply of estimating the food budget for families of various sizes with different numbers of children and different numbers of adults. Uh, and then a, as a rule of thumb, they took three times that budget as the poverty line. So historically, of course, over time, there have been enormous changes in what families, other families have to spend by way of a multiple of their, uh, of their food budget, but none of that has been reflected in the U.S. poverty line. What is, where is, what is the role of rent, of housing costs, at a time when one reads constantly of increasing costs? Sure, and in areas uh, where many of the poor live, such as the large cities, where there's a great deal of inequality and rents get bid up. Uh, rents are an increasing fraction of all families' income, and particularly the income of the poor. So then the question is what, what housing subsidies are available, and local jurisdictions differ an enormous amount in terms of the amount of housing subsidy they make available. And uh, the federal housing and urban development uh, uh, HUD provides also certain kinds of uh, supplements for uh, the poor. Uh, but altogether, those could be certainly looked at as being more support at the bottom of the income distribution. I keep interrupting you. Tell That's me okay. more about this agenda, this possible agenda. Well, uh, maybe to, to explain the agenda, we ought to go back and ask ourselves sort of what's increasing inequality and why it's increased. Not a long story. We'll do a short review. Please. Okay? Uh, because. Uh, I think people should understand uh, that what we want to do ought to be hooked to what we think has caused the increase in inequality. Uh, and there are really three factors. One is increasing labor market inequality, that is increasing inequality in wages, uh, particularly wage gains by college-educated workers, high-educated workers, and wage, real wage losses by low-educated workers. So one thing we really have to look at is how do we push up education at the bottom, improve education at the bottom, in order to, in order to compress uh, this wage differential, which has grown so much in our lifetime. I mean, just to give you a number, the college wage premium 30 years ago was on the order of 35%, now it's close to 100%. 100%? Yeah, so to give you some real numbers, um, a college, a high school dropout now makes an average of 19,000 a year. Uh, a high school graduate makes an average of $26,000 a year, and f if you have four years of college, the average uh, income is about 52000 So that gives you some idea of what this differential is in real terms in current, in current dollars. So that's one thing that we definitely have to look at, how to, how to improve our educational system and educational opportunity for uh, workers who, if they don't continue their education will suffer real wage penalties. Do I understand that in the last number of years, money is available to help kids at the lower end of the economic ladder uh, continue their education, aside from the question of the quality of, of public education, to go to college, to get that bonus yeah. that we have been putting less and less into uh, helping them? It's relatively less and less, so that if you look at uh, the size of Pell Grants, the national, right. which is our, our national federal expenditure to help disadvantaged students in post-secondary education, that's now about $9 billion. But if you compare that to, to the tuition bill, it's relatively less uh, 
a uh, smaller fraction of the tuition bill than it was 25 years ago. That's, that's where there's been an increasing shortfall between Pell Grants and, and tuition. And in part this is because of declining support for uh, public post-secondary education at the state level. So as state budgets have become increasingly under pressure, in part because of declining federal support to the states, they've squeezed their own education budgets and tuitions at state colleges and universities have increased relative to inflation and certainly relative to Pell Grants. I keep